Okay, yellow spot. So Chris brought in some um, samples. Quite often see it early, this semen uh, stage. Key point I want to make here, and we'll go into it, is we're talking about a necrotroph. It's not a biotroph. So a necrotroph kills the cells first, and then it feeds off the dead cells. And it kills it by producing a toxin, which is what gives the yellowing. The yellowing is the toxin production by the fungus, killing cells in advance of where it's going to feed next. Okay, and that's the key point. If you don't want it, don't say weed on weed or espresic, it can survive. So, so generally, I read up on this last night, generally 80 to 90 percent of the, the spores will be released in the first year after, but that depends on rainfall. So it needs rainfall, moisture for, mature, for the spores to mature on the stubble. If you get dry years, you can actually delay that maturity and you can get a significant amount into the, into the second year. Sorry? Is it the same with barley? Yeah, bar yeah okay, so this will, this will come at the end, but exactly the same. Different species, but everything I say about yellow spot is exactly the same with the net watches, just a different species. So barley is a barley on barley issue. So it's the barley stubble that hosts the net watches. But it's still producing a toxin in advance of where it, they're both necrotrophs, both producing toxin in advance of where Barley on barley seems to handle it better than wheat on wheat, would you say? Depends on the, there is varietal resistance, so it really, much. really de depends, yeah. Not as bad, yeah. But the, other, the, the, the issue with some of the barley too is, is just physiological spotting as well. But we'll go, we, we've got, we'll cover that. So one doesn't affect the other? No, no. Um, you got to hear that too, crops. <laughs> no, it, they are crop specific, but what's, what I think is happening with net watch is a lot of the net watch is misdiagnosed. The yellow spot fungus doesn't know whether it's landing on a wheat leaf or a barley leaf until it infects. Yeah. And in the process of trying to infect the, the resistance of the barley to the yellow spot fungus, you still get production of small brown spots, which I think are quite often again called net watch, spot form net watch. But we'll go into that, yeah. Okay, again, probably don't burn down your fences, but um, yeah, late autumn burn. So, in terms of yellow spot, which is a stubble one pathogen, if you burn that stubble off, you get rid of your inoculum source for yellow spot, okay? Not as effective for crown, you still get rid of crown on inoculum by burning but it can survive in the crown as well below ground. Um, which I know inter row sowing probably hasn't taken off as much, but burning an inter row sowing getting away from the old crowns can be quite effective for crown lot too. So just on that, so what about they burn and a cultivate? Does that spread it or does that make it worse? For or? crown rot? Yeah, for crown rot. Yeah, for crown rot, um, well it really depends, like, there's no clear, never yeah. a clear answer. Really depends. So what you'll, you'll find as a general rule, you get reduced survival in the crown than above ground because it's in the soil, you've got moisture, you've got more microbial activity. And if you look at, um, as, as we head further north, we have had decent summer rain, like up around Tamworth, Maury. Um, survival in the crown is way down this year, but there's significant survival. So some of the numbers are like 10% so on the same stem, 10% recovery from the crown, 70% in the above ground stubble. Um, so yeah, in terms of spreading around, I, I would leave it alone generally. So what, what you do is you, you just increase contact between the emerging seedling. Yeah. So the main infection point, one of the main infection points for crown rot is the coleoptile, the first structure that pushes to, to the, the top. There's no resistance at all in coleoptiles to infection by the crown rot fungus. So if you can try to limit that, that contact, um, then yeah, you limit the number of plants that get infected. And then the, the bump on benefit is the fewer plants that get infected, the fewer, less stubble that's got the fungus in it, the less you're dealing with through, through the cycle. So your stubble, stubble's an issue for sowing, you know, with, with some of that sowing thing, but in terms of just crown rot for, for the disease site, it's not the stubble such that's the problem, it's the amount of the crown rot fungus in it that's the issue. Okay, so if we can limit that and keep that, then yeah, we're fine. But the, the, the problem we always run into is, is that decomposition process. And we run into dry years, um, and what we're really chasing a lot at the moment is, is 2010. You can see that through Predictor B, which is a DNA test and the stuff we do really seen a bump up in crown rot levels, levels after 2010. Big year, heaps of stubble went back in. The, that moisture is very conducive to infection by the crown rot fungus. You don't see expression of whiteheads. So we've increased our infection levels and, and our stubble loads from that, and then we're chasing that through, through the cycle. So, and then you go to drying properties, you don't get the breakdown. You don't see the decline as quickly. That makes sense, yeah. It's a yellow spot. Um, I put this in here. The problem with that is some of those varieties are pretty poor for other things, like Sunvex is probably one of the better ones. H45 is very good for, um, for yellow spot resistance, but then you'll be managing it for strike rust. Sunvex, I don't think, 
think it's dead or dead or gross on this. It's an absolute sucker for, for um, nematodes. Fungicides are a poor last resort for yellow spot, and we'll go into why that is, okay? So there's a reason behind all this why we don't get the same job out of fungicides for, for yellow spots as we do with our strike rust. When we spray with strike rust, we kill the infection. We kill off the spores and it has to get successive cycles again to build up. That doesn't happen with yellow spot. As I said, it's a necrotroph. Yellow toxin production kills the cells. The cells dry off and we get that tan colour and that's where you get uh, secondary sporulation. Okay? Always got a yellow margin than dying brown tissue in the it. <coughs> You're lucky around here, Chris has uh, both days has brought in the right thing, but probably is the most misdiagnosed disease. And I get sampled, we, we, and you're more than welcome to use it, we run a free diagnostic service out of town with it's not free in that your levies actually pay for it, so feel free to send stuff over. But yeah, this is probably the one I get sent samples year after year. The grants has told me I've got yellow spot, I've got to spray it with a fungicide. I reckon about 80% of the time it's not. Okay, and this one we had a bit of a push on. Everywhere else this disease is called tan spot. So they focus on the dead tissue. Okay, I think our use of the word yellow spot, we've got a bit of a tendency, anything yellow, well it's got to be yellow spot, doesn't matter if it's not even a spot. Um, <laughs> and we'll just go spray it. So we'll go into that. Quickly, the cycle, so it does, it's got these pseudothesia they're called on the stubble. Um, they're like little volcanoes, they get wet, they expel spores under pressure, the ascus spores under pressure. They only shoot them 10 millimetres to be measured. I don't know who did that, but someone, someone sat there and was uh, detailed enough to that. So they're not, they're not going big distances up. That's why you get the lower leaves get infected. Okay, once you get the, the lower leaves infected, you get uh, secondary cycling and you get conidia produced. Okay, which are bigger structure, heavier structures. So they can actually blow distances you know, up, to 100, up to 100 metres. Whereas these guys are really restricted because they're so light um, and they, they, they stay in the canopy. Wide temperature range. Only need six hours of free moisture. Doesn't have to be rain, that can be dews. Quite a quick cycle. So from when a spore lands on a leaf to when you'll see the little pinprick of the infection, the browning with a bit of yellow, only four to seven days. The key point I want to make here, but it's actually repeated rain events that, first of all, you need, need moisture to get the, the, the initial infections, then to get the canidia produced on the old lesions. It's a, it's a, it's a cons... I can't think of the word. It's, it's a cycle where it's, it's gradually going up the canopy. It doesn't jump straight up the canopy. Okay, so it's really a function of really what years, 1998, 2010, where our big yellow spot years. We can see those early infections most years, but they don't ever come to anything. Okay, so you need to keep that in perspective. And we'll talk about, well, you can do it yesterday, but um, glad Christmas here is prompted around the perfect spray time. And I'll give you, I don't know the perfect spray time, but I'll give you my opinion based on what I know about the disease cycle and what's going on. It's, well, I think we can sort of pick when it's going to be the best. Okay, key issue with fungicides. They all move in the xylem, which is the water flow tissue in the plant, okay? You've got xylem and flame. Flame go both ways, so they move, tend to move the nutrients. Xylem only moves water. So where the fungicide hits in a droplet, it can only enter the leaf there and move to the tip of the leaf. It can never go back down. So when you get new leaves emerged, and you've sprayed, you sprayed, then you get leaves emerge after that, you can't get translocation or movement of the, the fungicide back out into the new leaves. Because it can only move to the tip of the ones that are sprayed that time. And that's important. It also becomes important when you think of this disease being a necrotroph and killing cells. Second, it kills cells, there's no xylem activity. So you can't get fungicide into dead tissue. I get asked this every year, why don't we just go spray our stubble for ground rot? You can do it, it won't do anything because it won't get uptake. There's no mechanism for it to get into their move through the stubble. So often we want to spray this really early, that mid-tilling spray, chuck it in with our broadleaf spray. Key issue there, the key yielding leaves aren't out. Okay, so your, your, your top three leaves aren't out at that stage. So in terms of protecting those, you're not going to have any effect. The other thing, this is some Canadian work, um, just showing that the actual release of those initial ascospores happens throughout the season. It's not just early. So two different years, look at the blue. So you're getting those released up around that uh, second node stage and you know, right, right through the season. So you can constantly get infected off the stubble in the paddock. 
the upfront measures just don't work. They, they haven't found one. Hopefully, that will become. There is one we'll talk about very briefly for NetWatch in Bali. There's a product out of BASF, Sestiva, which Nick Poole, who's an independent person, this isn't BASF data, but Nick Poole is down south, done independent stuff, is very effective against early infections with NetWatch. But they know and everyone else knows it does nothing for yellow spot. Same family of, of pathogen, but a different species. So really strange that it does one, it does absolutely nothing against another. And BAS have a very upfront that it does nothing for yellow spot too. Okay, I haven't put this up, but the big issue with yellow spot too is none of the products have curative activity. So once the infection's there, it can't kill off an established infection. Anyone used to spraying for Ascochyta and chickpeas? Exactly the same situation. There's no curative activity against Ascochyta and chickpeas. So when are all your sprays go on there? In front of a rain event. When do you do your yellow spot sprays? We've never thought about it. Okay, but we know. So there's some really good, uh, Nick Pearl again, is if you want to follow someone doing good fungicide stuff, Nick Poole, who's with uh, FAR, which is a New Zealand company, but they've got an Australian arm here, does some very good detailed work. Okay, so yeah, when you've got no curative activity, and you can't get into dead tissue, when we should be applying it? I think we need to target our applications before the rain event, which is going to be our infection event, because we can't kill it off. You never kill the infection, so you can't get into the dead tissue, so you certainly reduce the production of canidia when you spray on the dead tissue, but you don't totally stop it. And once the fungicide wears off, it's back on, and you're back into full production of spores if you've got the moisture, and you, you can keep advancing up the, up the plant. And also the protective properties vary. So we're used to using mainly um, propagonazole till and tetracotazole, which is follicle. Yep, they work, give you about three weeks protection. The only one that gives you longer protection is Amistar, which will probably give you four weeks. Very expensive. Or well, very expensive, more expensive, and really whether that length of protection is um, worth the extra money. The other issue with Amistar here, which is great, it's a uh, resistance management uh, thing. It's got another another uh, active in it, which is the Amistar Extra. The extra component in Tilt and the extra component in Amistar is Ciproconazole. Ciproconazole is a purely a rust product. It is quick moving through the leaf, so it'll move a lot quicker from where it hits a leaf to the tip than the other products. It's a rapid rust clean out product. Does nothing against yellow spot. Oops. Okay, so just quickly on timing for yellow spot. My take on timing for yellow spot is what we're going to do is buy ourselves timer for in a conducive year. It's going to be targeted to those really wet years. So the timing really is around that growth stage 30, 32, before the plant starts to elongate. If you get it after that, what you do when it elongates and you've got infection on the leaves, you're actually taking infected leaves up the canopy. You're not creating as big a barrier. So my, my critical thing, if you're really worried about it, is that timing there. You actually limit, um, limit the, the leaves as they elongate. You create more of a gap. You need successive rainfall events then to get up onto the top leaves. Is my, my take on it. So you buy yourself more time. So what you're doing is you're really forcing the climate to be super conducive before you're, you're losing those leaves and go in front of the rain. Event. Is a time machine better pushing a bit of that stubble away than this machine as far as disease goes? Why it make a difference for yellow spot because the spores are on the, on the stubble. Um, yes, certainly in terms of crown so Andy Ver Andrew Verrill, who's over at Tamworth, did that and got a um, slightly better excavation of the furrow and moving crown rot. So you need contact between stubble that's got the crown rot fungus in it and the plant to initiate infection. So we found times were um, cultivating or, or moving stubble out of the furrow a bit better. If you look at, and this is where I think where some of our research is going to go, and there's certainly been planted with, uh, down in South Australia, a guy called Alan Mackay, who actually runs that DNA test. They, they're using little um, scoop in front of the disc, and, and got, then got wings, and they're actually looking at soil throw. They're doing it for rhizoctonia. So rhizoctonia is a very shallow soil pathogen, rises that hyphal network. They're actually using that to move the inoculum out of that furrow and, and get it that way. And we're going to play with it for crown on. So yeah, certainly if, if you can move that stubble, limit that contact, um, then yeah, certainly can have an effect. So why they got the wings on it is actually, so then you've got the two adjacent rays thrown against each other and keeping it from falling back into the furrow. But yeah, that, that certainly is potentially a way to limit it. But then you're going to have to be in a, 
in a uh, stop or retain system. So if you've already worked it in, forget about it. You, you won't move those fragments out. Oh, uh, standing up and then you just yeah. sign with them. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, that's like, that is the big weakness of Crowdon. It needs contact. So it's a very, the reason why it's a very thin walled hyphae, which so it infects through, through cottony growth. It comes out of the stubble, it needs to be Dave Backhouse, a guy at, at, at uni did it. I don't do this detail stuff. But even two millimetres, because it's such a thin walled um, cottony structure, it break, gets chomped by other things really quick, by bacteria and other things. So it actually needs physical contact to protect it while it's infecting the plant. So when you harvest, if you went in and chopped all your stubble up, you're probably not doing yourself a lot of good when it comes to diseases? Um, it depends on the height. So generally at, at, at harvest, it's only up one or two nodes. And what you can get is it'll grow up to the cut height if you've got moisture over that sun period. But it'll only, it, it won't move around, it'll only be the ones that's already infected. It can colonise that, that tissue. So it's a, it's a saprophyte, which means it just grows on the, the carbon in the stubble. Um, and it's also a pathogen. So when we go into that summer period, it can become just a saprophyte. It's just, it can grow up. So yeah, certainly when you, if you set your, your, your head at, um, lower, you're generally not blowing an optimum out the back. The issue we've never looked into is really our harvest high around chickpeas. I'm sort of talking after your harvest, come back and just chop it off at ground level, just mash it all up. Yeah, yeah. And whether that would be a beneficial for your disease or, or a hindrance or what? Um, the, never a clear answer. Could be really good. Could be really bad. Depends on whether it breaks down. <laughs> so it depends on your moisture. So if you go, if you go and um, if you, yeah, so, so, so breaking up into small bits, creating that mat, you'll maintain moisture if you get a rainfall event, you'll drive your decomposition. So if you get the moisture, it could be really great. Um, but if you don't, what you've done is you've taken that and spread it more evenly across your paddock. When we do all our crown lot work, uh, we deliberately go in and mulch just before we sow. So we take our stubble that's got an optimum in it, we mulch it, spread it so we get even infection. Which is potentially what you can do if you don't get the breakdown over that summer period. But yeah, it could be. It's all confusing. There's, no, well, there's no, there's no answers. Like, like if, you, if you knew, if you knew you were going to get reliability of rainfall to get the decomposition to happen, it would be brilliant. And you get the mulch, you get some mulching effect of, of doing that stuff. But the, so, so, yeah, I, I don't have an, uh, an issue with it. But what you're going to run into every now and then is you're going to go, shit, I wish I hadn't done that. Because you go and spread the inoculum and it didn't break down. Like we had the Kelly Janes and they went off then and now the speed tillers. And you, the bigger issue I got with Kelly, the bigger issue I've, 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 I've got with that, that cultivation is you're actually playing the, the crown of fungus' hand. You're actually putting your inoculum into the soil below ground, which are the main infection sites. The main infection is the coleoptile, which then becomes, as, as the plant agent becomes subcranular, and the crown tissue. So the second you've gone and put that inoculum into that zone, you've, you've given contact of the fungus to your plant. Whereas when you're left it alone, and particularly even if you just offset something, you're limiting the ability of the plant to contact that. So it's all about the amount of inoculum that ends up down in a furrow in that, that sowing process is the issue. So and that's, that's the, bigger, the, the bigger issue I've got, I've, I've got with that. We're going to, and but the problem is we're going to like we're going to be looking into some of these things if we get driven by herbicide resistance in our weeds, then these things are all back on the table. I think there's things we just there's benefits and there's downsides to everything. That's what my wife tells me. <laughs> so if you had just to throw the confused that we've all had a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah, this is great. An old burn. Yep. Not a fence post burner, but like a you know, nice cool burn. You just took the top of the stubble off, and then you in a road between those crowns. Would that be a probably best result we ever got? We got a so in a decent crown rock load, we've got a 92 percent reduction in the percentage of plants that got infected yep. by a late burn in a row. So as long as you can, and, and this is the other thing too. Like so, we've been talking about in a row sowing, and people go, "Oh yeah, but my plant, my, my, my plant wanders and end up back on the row occasionally and that sort of thing." It's really the glass half full of everything. Even if you're off it, like that's still less contact. Um, we saw it certainly in the Central West Farming Systems trial, the one at Ningen there uh, last year, you could see it in there. So the, they went back over um, a grower's paddock. The, unfortunately, the Central West Farming System sowed in the same um, direction as the previous crop rows. And there, where they had their rows contacting the, the growers' old cereal rows, you could see the crown on. The actual MBT trial was sown at right angles to the previous sowing angle. 
And that was really a lot less crowded because it wasn't contacting that inoculum as much. It was really when it, it, it crossed across. And that's some of the things they're talking about over in WA is, is what they call it, cross hatch sewing. And yeah, just try to limit it that way. If you Google ProTracker, that might be the next thing we can get on. ProTracker is a hitch steering that now ties in with your Green Star or your 750, so that'd be cheap, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing too, and this is this Andrew Verrill, he's a researcher at Tamworth. And when, if you can do that in a row sign, I think that's going to be a, a big thing. And then it's about, the work he's taken it further is, it's about where you put your brake crop row in relation to your wheat row. So what he's shown, with, he did show in chickpeas canola, is you sow your brake crop row in between your cereal row, and then your next wheat row comes back over your brake crop row. Okay, then your brake crop row over that is actually, I've got to, I'd have to map it out, but it goes back over your, your, your original wheat rows, um, and then you follow that. So what you always have, your wheat rows or your cereal rows going over your brake crop rows. And what you do is you end up with a four year gap between contacting your inoculum. And what you're doing is you're just driving it, you're making it, driving it down all the time. So I think there's ways, ways of, of playing with that. And this is why we've, we've run into problems with, sorry, we didn't want to talk crown rot. We've run into problems with crown rot because some certain things in our system have changed. So crown rot's taken off up north because mainly because they're trying to use a chemical in chickpeas and they're worried about washing back into furrows. So it's not uncommon, so their chickpeas and they go in and, and uh, work it shallowly to get rid of their furrows, so they can use balance. And they're spreading their inoculum doing it. And we don't get as much breakdown in a chickpea crop as you do in a canola crop, flavour crop, because you haven't got the density of the canopy to maintain, maintain moisture around the stubble. That's a crowd I talk about. My phone. How common is that inoculum in the stem? I mean, some of the geodesic flat sheets, they like, show sand stems above the ground cut off this big pot of wool. How common is it? Oh. I've seen it that. I mean, if you go around and say, well, I want to check every 100 metres, I'll pick up an ant or stubble and cut it off and see if that's in there and see what potential for having around. Right? Yeah, You've got to be pretty wet for it to actually produce the whole mass to fill the, the middle of the stem. So yeah, not. I don't think it's a good gradient indicator. So there's certainly DNA test predictability, and we've we've worked with them on sampling strategies for crown. It's actually spike it with stubble. was overcome a lot of the issues there. Um, or you know, plating plating to figure out what your actual survival levels are. Probably more than likely. Want to go back to yellow spot? <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. First off, I guess the first step is really making sure it's yellow spot. Um, these are just samples that come in. So what we do as, as a pathologist, we get a sample in, we cut leaf segments, we put it in what we call a human chamber. So we cut the segments up, put it in a petri dish with moist filter paper. Basically, you can get the fungus to spirulate you know, in, within 48 hours. Then we can look at those under the microscope, and they've got distinctive canidia. And that's how we definitively can say well, that spot was caused by this fungus. You can't do that. Well, you probably could, you <laughs> Anyway, first thing, tick some boxes in terms of the eye spot. It's got to be wheat stubble visible. It mightn't be last year's, but it, or, or it might be the year before. But you've got to be able to see wheat stubble. If it's buried or burnt, then you've got to wonder where it's coming from. The other thing is, You've got to see these spreading structures. So if you look around, and you can even go where you've got more symptoms, look at the stubble that's lying there, you'll see these spreading structures. Even after they release, they'll still be there. There we go. You can pass that around, mate. Well, you can't miss them, can you? The other thing too, just do this. Rub your, rub your finger across them. So there is other little black spores, but the thing with those is they feel a bit abrasive. They feel a little bit like sandpaper. That's the microscopic spines on the top of those spores. You're rubbing those off as you knock it with your finger, so probably by the time it gets around here, you might feel it quite as That's 2013 stuff as well. Does any of this stuff come off barley grass? Um, you can get, um, not yellow spot doesn't, no. You can get the uh, net watches will host on barley grass, yeah. Oh. yeah. You'll see the same thing, you should see. see um, so what you, what's the issue there is more is they'll get infected off your barley stubble and you'll get um, production. What about in like native grass, native perennial grasses that are in a fallow situation, you often see if the butts aren't broken down. Not for net wash, it's not an issue, issue for crown rot. Crown rot, yep. yeah. There yeah, right.
okay? Then the spots actually got to be right. So again, remember, so if you can take nothing away, the yellow is toxin, necrotroph killing cells, yellow toxin, then dying behind it. They elongate, they get bigger, they keep producing toxin in advance of where they're going to feed next. What should be this one? Then they get bigger, okay? Then they start to elongate, but they're still producing toxin, yellow, in advance of where they, they want to feed next. And they end up joining up, but you've still got that yellow. So it's tight yellow around it, not general yellowing of the whole leaf. Here's what it looked like. These are all things that have been sent in over the last year called yellow spot. I don't know how they got yellow spot out of that, but anyway. That was a contact herbicide. <laughs> These others were actually phytotoxicity for herbicides. Um, so yeah, so have you got that tight yellow margin? It doesn't cause general yellowing. The other one, Chris is fortunate enough, so you can pass these around too. You can do that, mate. You can, mess, you can be responsible for messing up the, the ground. First thing I do when I get one is I pull just a single tiller off. I better be careful I do this right. You never. I try to always just look at a, a single tiller. So if it's yellow spot, there's going to be a clear distribution. Remember, it's coming off stubble. There's initial sp infection, those spores only going one centimetre. So what you'll see in distribution is you'll always have more on the lower sleeve less on the next leaf up, and even fewer on the, the one up from there. Okay, because it's coming from below ground. The other thing you'll see um, clearly, this is great pictures. The other thing you'll see is you tend to have a random distribution of all the leaf. Okay, so where the infection is just where a spores landed on the leaf, got the moisture requirement, and infected. Okay, you don't get it concentrating. So something like this where you're getting concentration of the symptoms towards the leaf is not characteristic of a disease. Because there's no reason a spore wants to, wants to move anything. The other one we run into every year is, uh, Gregory's one that do it, you get this leaf tipping around that flowering stage onwards. And I've heard this called yellow spot before. Nothing to do with it. It's actually called leaf tip necrosis. It's just a function of having particular leaf rust gene and stripe rust gene combination. It's just physiological, nothing to do, nothing you can do about it. It's just a function of having that durable resistance. Called tan spot, everyone else. So hopefully you, you start thinking more of tan, that dead tissue does not cause general yellowing of leaves. What does tend to cause general yellowing of leaves? Herbicide phytotoxicity and certainly interaction with frost. We saw a lot of this last year. Okay, sprays that went on, they got a frost event. When you put a herbicide on, your crop still has to deal with that, that chemical. It has to metabolise that chemical. If you have a frost event, it slows its metabolism. It can't get rid of us it quick. It moves to the tip and can cause that yellowing, that phytotoxicity. And I don't know about you guys, but when we get back over Liverpool Plains, which is high input, um, sometimes in some of their sprays, uh, water's the lowest actual constituent. <laughs> we even had people with nitrogen deficiency trying to cause yellow spot. Nitrogen's got a, a clear distribution as well. The plant wants to reproduce, so it'll, if it's running out of air, it'll move it out of the lowest leaves and preferentially keep putting it to the new leaves. And you'll see that. So the lowest leaf will go, go a light green, then go yellow and die off, and they'll then uh, yellow off from the, the next leaf up. Remember, repeated rain events is what drives yellow spot. So really it's a function of wet years. And this is the photo I like to put up at the end of the thing. So yes, there's yellow spot here. We can see clear yellow margins, dead leaf in behind it. You have more than one thing. Not often you only have one thing going on in a crop. You've got end deficiency going on here. And what they're finding with a lot of their work, this is out of WA, a lot of work in WA, they get a lot better efficacy out of their fungicide if they put some nitrogen on at the same time. Because I think you think the nitrogen's correcting this, whereas the fungicide's really just preventing that bit. We happy with yellow spot? So if you're going to yellow spot and crown, what I should say. If nitrogen was to go on with it, are you better off using a liquid one that you can put on with a fungicide if you were going to go down that path? Or? Well, you do. Well, you limit by how much you can put on in that application. But yeah. Yeah, would that be enough to help uptake it, though? With, like, oh, it's not an uptake. It's just actually keeping the, the leaf green. Yeah, okay. So if you got, so it's actually there's, there's no um, yeah no indication that they're actually synergistic. It's just one's correcting one problem, the other's correcting another. So it's, the nitrogen's correcting a problem which I think is getting misdiagnosed as yellow spot. Yeah. 